Sabbath peace. Sabbath peace. It's another opportunity for us to come together in here and learn of the word of truth that's given to us by the Most High God. All honor goes to the Father through the Son, whose name is Yahushua. In him lies the only hope for salvation. We know that it is obtained by grace through faith and not of works, lest anyone should boast and give him freely as a gift to all who obey him. We understand that if you do not obey him, it is made manifest or made obvious that you do not believe. In this state, you should expect no good thing from the Most High. However, anything that you do get, whether it be a gift of tongues, a gift of prophecy, or any supernatural experience that you may have, it can and it will be used against you in the day of judgment. With that said, peace to the saints that are in the room, to the saints that couldn't make it, to the saints watching in on the cameras, to the saints scattered that we don't even know about. But no peace to the wicked. The only thing we say to them is repent that they might live. Let's uh, recap. Last week, we talked about um, the book of Nehemiah. I want to say we left off at about chapter 8. So Nehemiah, he he was getting our, you know what I'm saying, he's trying to, trying to restore the land, trying to restore the feeling of the land. You know what I'm saying? So this is after the point of Ezra. We read, a, uh, we read the book of Ezra. And where we left off, remember, Ezra was, was trying to get the people back in order. He was trying to teach the people the law, right? So this is after that. So you had Nehemiah come in, and he's around the same time. And what he's doing is he's trying to, like, rebuild our borders. So he's working on a wall. And these people worked on the wall, him, his servants, and the people of the land, side by side, worked on the wall and built it up. Then they start getting messed with by the Gentiles that was nearby, just like in Ezra. In Ezra, the Gentiles were messing with us too, right? So the Gentile came back and they started they start messing with us. So Ezra, he told everybody, he was like, man, go ahead. You know what I'm saying? Like half of y'all work, the other y'all, y'all stay and watch. You know what I'm saying? Just in case these Gentiles try to attack us. They tried to trick him. Remember, they told him, they was like, listen, you know what I'm saying? You better hide. You know what I'm saying? Go hide. Go run in the temple. They tried to set him up knowing that if he walked into, the, for those of us doing the Bible in the year, we know that we looking at we looking at the, the scripture right now about who is who is it lawful for to go into the temple. And that's only that's only the sons of Aaron. Right. That's only the sons of Aaron. So now they he looking like, man, go run into the temple. They looking like, no, I mean, uh, they, they telling him to go look at running the temple. He looking like, no, we can't do that. You know what I'm saying? He said, no, nah, I'm just going to stay here and I'm going to stand on mine. Right. So Nehemiah, he wasn't scary. Right. Nehemiah wasn't scary. Nehemiah, you know what I'm saying? He 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 about everything he's talking about. So we're gonna keep <coughs> reading and kind of see what else we can pick up. This is uh Nehemiah chapter nine. It's Nehemiah chapter nine. Give me verse one. Now, in the 24th day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting, with sackcloth and earth upon them. The seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers and stood and confessed their sins and their iniquities of their fathers. They stood up in their place and read in the book of the law of the Lord, their God, one fourth part of the day. And another fourth, they confessed and worshiped Yahuwah, their God. Then stood upon the uh, upon the stairs of the Levites, Yahushua and Bani, Kadmiel, Shabaniah, Benui, Sherebiah, Benai, and Kinani, 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 and care and cried with a loud voice unto Yahuwah their God. Then the Levites, Yahushua and Kadmiel, Bani, Hashbaniah, Sherebiah, Hodijah, Shabaniah, and Pithahiah said. Stand up and bless Yahuwah your God forever and ever, and blessed be thy glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. Thou, even thou art Yahuwah alone, and hast made heaven the heavens of heavens with all their hosts, the earth and all the things that are therein, and the seas and all that is therein. Thou presentest them all, and the host of heaven worships thee. Thou art Yahuwah God, who did choose Abram and, and broughtest him forth out of Ur of the Chaldees, and gave us to him the name of Abraham, and found his heart faithful before thee, 
and made a covenant with him to give the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, and the Jebusites, and the Girgashites to give it. I say to his seed, and has performed thy words, for thou art righteous, and did see the affliction of our fathers in Egypt, and heard their cry before the Red Sea. And you I want y'all to, I want y'all to, I want y'all to pay attention to some. I want y'all to pay attention to the details, right? Notice how the people that's written about in this book, surely there are many people. There are probably some good people. You know what I'm saying? There are probably some God-fearing people that didn't make this book. But notice it's a common theme that the people who like who are written and documented in this book, they know our history, they know our law, they know the scripture. Right? Like he's not just like, like he's telling in his prayer and his praise to the most high God, he's recounting our history from Abraham. Right? A lot of times we think we, it's a, some, some people take, think it's a light thing to know this book. Right? And I'm not even saying it's required that anybody who don't know the book like him is going to be, you know what I'm saying? Going to, going to hell. That's that, 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 I don't have no book to say that. Right? But what I am saying is, when you model yourself after the people that we read about in this book, man, you got to put your faith towards studying, right? Everything in you got to go like, how do I know more about the most high God? How do I understand his word a little better? That just got to be our push. It should be a nonstop push for those of us who want to strive towards it, right? Because that's the people that we read about, man, they know what they talking about. They not guessing. They said they quote book. They retell stories in a book from memory. He just in there in the middle of the prayer, just going through it. Like, yeah, Abraham, you brought him out from the Chaldees. You know what I mean? Then you gave him the name Abraham. Made a covenant with him. You know what I'm saying? With the Canaanites and the Hivites and the, and the Perizzites. You know what I'm saying? And then after that, you know what I'm saying? So he just like going through it. In his mind, he, he, this is, this is common knowledge for him. Right, keep going. Right, and then even like we we pass some, but even go back. Uh, what was that where it said for a uh, for a fourth of the day? For a fourth, what is it? A fourth part of the day? And they stood up in their place and read in the book of the law of Yahuwah their God one fourth part of the day. So and look for a whole <laughs> look a one fourth part of the day. Is give or take three hours. Right? So for three hours straight, they opened the book and read. Last week we ended off where they stood up and they read from the book. And you remember we talked about it how it was interesting that when he started reading, that's when the people stood. Right. And we kind of reflected on man, a lot of the churches we've been into, it's the opposite. The people sit when the word about to be preached. And we stand for the choir or for the music. In this case, it was the opposite. When he started to read, that's when everybody stood up. And you know, when you get to reading, what happens? You start nodding off. Like, mm, you know what I'm saying? You can't get too comfortable when you read. Get your butt up. Right? So everybody stood up and started listening. Now, that happened for three, give or take, right? Three eight. hours. It's about eight hours. Huh? Wait, yeah, yeah, about six hours. Three to six hours, yeah. You said what? It's six hours. Well, 24 hours would be six hours, but it's the day. So oh, yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah, they, they, said, they said three hours. So, you know what I'm saying? Give or take three hours. They sitting there and they going through it like, let me hear this word. Right? It's a different level of commitment when it, I just want to hear the word. I'm not going to the word. A lot of people go to the word trying to, trying to solve a particular problem that they got going on in their life. Oh, well, you know. You know, I, I lost my, you know what I'm saying? I lost my, my father, and uh, I just need something out of the word to cheer me up. Man, that's abuse. That's abuse of the word. I get it. You know what I'm saying? Like, I do. I do get it. Like, some stuff going on in the world, and sometimes you just be wanting to pick me up. But if you get used to using the word as a pick-me-up, man, there's some slick tongue pastors about to, about to make a mess out of your book. That's not what the word is there for. Right, the word is there to break us apart. Where's that? And uh, what is that? Jeremiah? What is it? Twenty? What is that? Jeremiah? Uh, 
I don't know. Keep going. I'll find it. And showed signs and wonders upon Pharaoh <clears throat> and all the servants and all the people of his land. For you knew that they dealt proudly against him. So did thou get thee a name as it is this day. And thou did divide the Red Sea before them so that they went through the midst of the sea on the dry land. And their persecutors thou threw into the deeps as a stone into the, the mighty waters. Moreover, you led us them in the day. You led them in the day by a cloudy pillar and in the night by a pillar of fire to give them light and the way wherein they should go. Now came as right? This is all the stuff we reading about right now. Most High God put, Most High, look, when we coming out, the Most High God is, it's, it's like what we about to read. We're about to go into the New Testament. Sabbath peace, Sister Sharon. We're about to go into the New Testament, right? And what we're going to see in the New Testament is a bunch of signs and wonders. Right? Because y'all sure like, man, listen, they ain't going to believe unless they had a sign. He knew who our people were, right? And so Yahuwah knew that also when we came out of Egypt. He knew that it ain't no way these people going to believe except for signs and wonders. So what did he tell to Moses? As soon as Moses was like, man, these people ain't about to believe me. He was like, listen, you know what I'm saying? You see your hand? Go ahead and stick them in your bosom. When they say bosom, it's talking about the side. Go ahead and stick it in your side like this. You know what I'm saying? Now pull it out. And his hand is white, leprous, like snow. Right? Then he said, all right, but if that don't get him, go ahead, reach for your staff right there. You know what I'm saying? Go ahead, reach for it. Grab the staff. He said, throw it on the ground. He threw it on the ground. And then he turned into a snake. Moses jumped back like, whoa. You know what I'm saying? Then after that, he told him, go ahead. Go grab it by the tail. See what happens. He grabbed by the thing by the tail. Turned right back into a staff. Right? He said, show them these things. You know what I'm saying? Turn the water into blood. Show them these things and they'll believe you. Sure enough, he showed them and all the people like, man, let's do it. Right? So the most high God can, or throughout our time in the wilderness, he showed us sign after sign. Right? Whether it's all the plagues that he put on Egypt, the way he separated the Hebrews from the Egyptians, the way he, he split the Red Sea for us, the way he made water come out of rocks. Right. He made bread come from the sky in the in the uh, in the morning and at night he made quail fall from the sky. Right. These are different things that he he did for us to show us like, oh, no, no, he's the one. Right. Then we get over into the land and he caught we we up against. John, ain't no way we supposed to win this thing. But he's sending plagues before us. He's sending bees and everything, stinging these people, messing these people darn up. Right? We get to see this stuff in real life and in real action. And what that does is that creates in us a level of faith. Right? We start to see these signs and it creates in us a level of faith. It gets us to the point where we're looking like, okay, you know what? I can rock with him. But at some point, the signs and the wonders go away. And you know what we have to rely on when that happens? We have to rely on the word. So that's why Ezra and Nehemiah is putting such an emphasis on it because they understand that. They looking like, no, no, no. We just got messed up. We just came from captivity. It's a mess right now. It's not looking good. Right? So they looking like, we have to teach the people the word. No more playing around. Everybody come out. Let's talk. Hear the word for three hours straight, give or take. We standing up, going through the word, reading it right out the what? What they are reading? Book of the law. Right out of the book of the law. That's what Moses gave us. Right? Most high God didn't give us all this book just to just sit on it. And I know how it make us feel when we read it, certain parts of it. That thing make you feel like, ooh, I'll be doing that. Ooh, I'm, am I wrong for that? Ooh, I got to stop doing that too? That's how it's supposed to make you feel. We spend too much time walking around not feeling nothing. Empty on the inside. Inside our body abused from all the sin that we do. Right? Don't nothing bother us. Don't nothing affect us. Words supposed to come in and shake all that stuff up. 
right? Grab uh grab uh Jeremiah. It was Jeremiah 23. It's Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 29. Watch what the book say. It's Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 29. Is not my word like as a fire? Says he said, is not my word just like a fire? And like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? Uh-huh. How do you think that feel? How do you think it feel? How I fire feel? And how does it feel to be, to be, a, be hit by a hammer? The same type of hammer and the same type of strike that'll break a rock in pieces. That don't feel good. That don't feel comforting. That don't feel uplifting. We have to reset our expectations. We be coming into it like, oh, well, well, God, God is begging me to come to him. That's not the God we're talking about. We're not talking about no God that's begging you to be saved. That's not, that's not what we're reading out of this book. We talk about the most high God who lay a standard, give an opportunity. And you got to make a choice. When you have the right expectation, you know what you're looking for. If you're sitting here expecting that God is constantly reaching out for you like this, begging you, just please come to me. Please, I really, really, really want you to be saved. Then you might feel like you got some time. You might feel like, okay, well, I can play hard to get for a little while. And then, you know what I'm saying? Right before I die, I can kind of clean it up and go. But no, you're playing with a God that don't like to be mocked. So if that's your plan, right, when that be your plan, like, you know, I'm going to get it together eventually. I just, you know, I got a few things I want to get off first. If that's your plan, he is not mocked. You're going to get caught up in your stuff and not even realize it and be out of here before your brain can change, before your mind can change, before your heart can change. We looking at all this new booty stuff, boy. We, we all these boy. All these boy, all this stuff that they talk about today is new. This stuff is new. They not talking about they not talking about nothing historical. All this stuff they just came up with it. They just came up with all this stuff, and they think they doing something. Don't know nothing. Back in the darn sixties and the seventies, I was reading, and they were talking about the ice age is coming back. They look like man, if you look at you look at the world. We got models that tell us the ice age is coming back. It's going to be a second ice age. Right? Then a couple decades later, they start talking about, oh, actually, we're overheating. It's global warming. Then it starts getting cool again. Hurricane Katrina, all that other stuff. So, you know, they have to switch it up. They're like, okay, we don't call it global warming anymore. And we ain't going to call it the second ice age. Because that's too confusing because the weather going to keep doing this and up and down and we ain't going to be able to predict it. So you know what they came up with? Climate change. That's because these people are a prisoner to what's happening right now. All of us are. We are all a prisoner. We don't live but 70, 80 years. So we're all prisoners to what's happening right now. And in being a prisoner to that, that mindset, and being a prisoner to what we observe, we don't have, we don't have, that's like trying to take advice from a kid that ain't experienced nothing. Right? A lot of these kids, some of these kids think they know, they think they understand, they think they know. They think they got it figured out. You ever seen how indecisive a kid can be? Because they haven't, they haven't learned and been hardened by the, by the decisions that you have to commit to in life. So in their mind, I could just choose this, but no, I just changed my mind. Like, no, I just made you that. I just cooked that whole plate for you. You know what I'm saying? What do you mean you just changed your mind? What do you mean you're not hungry no more? Right? That's how God see us because we only got this limit, li real limited scope of life. Right? And we think we got it figured out because it's like, oh, well, I know more. I know more than Joe. Joe's standing next to me. I know more than him, so I got to be smart. <coughs> I be walking around in my job like, man, I'm always the smartest person in the room. You know what I'm saying? Pat myself on the back. Then one time I sat in this meeting 
And it's the dude, he's speaking all these topics that he's like, everything, everybody bring up, he know about it. I'm looking like, but that's a bad boy. You know what I'm saying? He went to school, got degrees, got experience, got all that stuff. I look at him like, man, you a fool if you think you the only one. Right? You got to look at this stuff like, man, ain't none of us special. Ain't none of this stuff going on. The only thing we got is to serve the most high God. And the only way to serve the most high God is to forget this new stuff that they trying to teach. Right? They try everything, all their perspectives, all they, all their ideology on politics, on history, all this stuff is new stuff. These people think the darn moon landing fake. It might be though. You know what I'm saying? The darn world is flat. They think, they think it's Neanderthals that was, that we evolved from, as opposed to what everybody thought in all the history that they're giants. But it's because they limited view, they can't see it. It's this it, we done with the new stuff. We gotta go back to what you know what I'm saying. Go back. Grab uh grab uh Jeremiah chapter six. Give me about verse nine. It's Jeremiah chapter six, verse nine. Right? We gotta get back to the old path. We gotta get back to what it used to be. See, me people gonna call you crazy. They gonna look at you, you start. You start modeling your life off after the scripture, they're going to look at you crazy. This don't make no sense. Right? And that's how you know you're doing something. That's our job is to separate ourselves from these people. This is uh, Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 9. <clears throat> Thus says Yahoo of hosts. They shall thoroughly glean the remnant of Israel as a vine. Turn back thine hand as a grape gatherer into the baskets to whom shall i speak and give warning that they may hear behold behold their ear is uncircumcised and they cannot hearken behold the word of yahuwah is unto them a reproach they have no delight in it therefore i am full of the fury of yahuwah i am weary with holding it in i will pour it out upon the children abroad and upon the assembly mm. of young men together for even the oh. husband and the wife shall be taken what verses are uh, 11. Mm. Sure, it's not Isaiah. Jump down. Give me 16 is what you want. It's 16? Yeah. Okay. This is uh, Jeremiah Ooh. chapter uh, 6, verse 16. I thought it was verse 9. Thus says Yahuwah, stand ye in the ways and see. Look, he said, stand thee in the ways and see. In other words, stand in the middle of the street and pay attention. Watch this. And ask for the old paths. He said, ask for the old path. Watch this. Where is the good way? And walk therein. And ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. We got to ask ourselves, what is the goal? What are we trying to accomplish? Because it's a way to save time. If what we're trying to accomplish is to see the most high God in the end, then this is what we got to do. We got to stand in the way. We got we to gotta see. We got to ask, yo, where's the old path? That good path. And after we find it, we got to walk in it. Right? We have to walk in it. The rest of this stuff is meaningless. Right, the rest of this stuff will get us caught up. The only thing we're looking at is how do I serve the most high God? I can help you out with that. Learn the word. You ain't got to go off of nobody's opinion. You ain't got to go off of nobody. Once you know the word, once you can say, I believe this because this verse says it, this verse says it, and this verse say it, and it don't contradict none of the others. When you have that, that is called rightly dividing the word. That comes with a level of confidence. You ain't got to say, well, I guess or I believe or maybe it's going to turn out this way. It's different. 
when you know it. And it's not impossible to know. That's what they want you to think. The people that tell you, oh, well, you know, it's just, you know, it's all based off of interpretation. People look at the people who say that are the people who don't actually know the book. When you know the book, you will see it's really not that much interpretation. The book say what it say. Only thing we really, the only thing we really, look, I know y'all, I know it sounds far fetched. The average of these people that be talking and teaching and on TV and off TV and on YouTube with millions of followers talking about this book don't know the book. They don't read it. They don't know about it. They don't study it. They learn the pieces that they talk about from somebody who taught it to them and they repeat what they knew. They study to make an argument. Right. They talk to these boys. They develop a doctrine. And now when they look in the Bible, they look in to prove their doctrine. They know how to prove their doctrine. They know how to prove the stuff that they've been taught. They do not actually know the book. Right. It's different when you get all that stuff up out of you and just read it. Because now you're not trying to force nothing to happen. You just letting it happen. Like, eh, it don't matter. I ain't got no dog in the fight. Whatever God say is right. That's what's right. It's simplicity in that. The only way you get it is from reading this book, understanding this book, not necessarily reading it, but from understanding this book. I encourage y'all to read it, though. But I don't want to lie to nobody and make it seem like it's, it ain't nothing in the Bible that tells you you have to read the book. Right? Nothing in the book to tell you that. So I don't want to. That, that can't be my message. When I speak, I got to speak according to the oracles. You know what I'm saying? I can't just be out here making stuff up like the rest of these guys do. I don't even know where we is at. Where we is at? Oh, Nehemiah. Go back to Nehemiah. Is Nehemiah what? Chapter 9? Verse what? Uh, verse, two, verse 13. This is Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 13. They out there reading the book, right? He making a prayer. And after he, uh, you know what I'm saying? Have, jump on. We on verse 13 or did we uh, pass that already? And I had you go back. We on 13. All right. So they making a prayer. And, and, and in his prayer, he shows just, just based off of the way that he pray, he know the book. That's beautiful to me. I love, listen, I can respect people who understand this book. I respect people for a lot of stuff. But man, when I see somebody who understand the book, even when, even if we disagree about certain things, I be looking like, but that brother know what he's talking about. It's a young, it's not a young lady. It's a lady that called me. Um, she don't call me no more. But she called me and she, I mean, just as Christian as she can be. But she knows a lot about the book and the Old Testament too. See, I remember, I forgot what it was. She opened up something in Genesis. He was like, yeah, what you think this mean, brother? I was looking like, I ain't never seen no Christian notice no detail like that. I forgot what it was. It was some, it was some minute detail that I ain't never noticed. And she was like, yeah, but you ain't never noticed that this, I got to find it because I wrote it down somewhere. I got to find out what it was because we, we probably about to read in our Bible in the year read. We probably about to read and whatever she showed me. It was some, uh, it was either Leviticus or Numbers. It was one or two. But yeah, you know what I'm saying? She showed me some stuff. I'm looking like, you know, I'm gonna tell you the truth. Well, I ain't never, I ain't never seen that. I ain't never seen that. You know what I'm saying? Now you wrong about what it means, but you know what I'm saying? Like the detail, the fact that you under you you caught that detail, nobody taught you to catch that detail. That just come from you. You was actually reading. You can tell when these people got taught what they talking about, right? But some of these, some people actually study this book and really trying to figure it out, right? And then the next, the that that's one step. The real step, the one that's going to lead you into the kingdom is, I just want to, I ain't trying to prove nothing. I ain't trying to disprove nothing about what nobody else say. If you prove something, me and Sister Pamela, we got a similar approach, right? Sister Pamela, she told me, she was like, look, I got my, my hypothesis and I want to prove it or disprove it. That's good. That's cool. Cause that's a, that's fine. Cause you, 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 uh, I call it auditing. You auditing yourself, right? When you do that. You say, hey, this is what I believe, but what do the book teach me? And you can do, then tear down what you believe or not. But you can't be going to the book trying to prove or disprove what somebody else say, what somebody else teaching is. That can't be your reason for looking at the book. No, you just got to let that thing teach you and then tear down what's in you. Oh, we're going we gonna to spend a lot of time in Jeremiah. Give me Jeremiah, what is it, four? Give me Jeremiah four. It might be one, actually. Where's a tear down? Is that four or one? Or is it three? Mm, it might be one. Yeah, let's try one. Give me one. I'm going to say 18. This is Jeremiah chapter one, verse 18. Uh, 
Yeah, I was talking to a brother today. And actually went a little better than I thought. But you know, he uh, you know, the the brother, the brother or no, it was a uh it was a it was uh I think it was a sister actually. She said, um, she asked a question, what was it? Um Oh, I can't remember what the original question was, but whatever it was, somebody answered her question by quoting Yahushua and saying, Oh no, the question was the question was, uh it was a brother actually. The question was was uh was Yahushua talking in 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 John chapter three, or was it John the writer John that was talking? You know what I'm saying? Like was he giving commentary, or was it Yahushua's words himself? He quoted when Yahushua was like the Son of Man is gonna come. You know what I'm saying? He gonna come uh from from the heaven. And so another brother popped in. He is like, yeah, notice that he said the Son of Man which is in heaven. You know what I'm saying? Pretty much just saying Yahushua is not talking about like Yahushua is admitting that he's not the son of man. It's pretty much what he is trying to say without saying it. So I jumped in and I was just like, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Son of man, you know what I'm saying? Is a reference to the prophecy of Daniel. You know what I'm saying? And when they say in heaven, it's talking about in the sky. You know what I'm saying? So it's not saying the son of man right now is located in heaven. No, he's saying the son of man that's prophesied by Daniel. You know what I'm saying? That comes from the sky. He's identifying what he's talking about. Brother was like, yeah, but this is this is what the Son of Man looked like, quoted Revelations. Right? That's all I said. He quoted Revelations. This is what the Son of Man looked like, woolly hair. And Yahushua didn't look like that 2,000 years ago. I'm like, bro, <laughs> if you don't believe in Yahushua, I'm sure not trying to make you believe. That's not my purpose of comment. I'm just trying to teach you what the book means. That's it. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you got a question, ask it to me. But I'm not trying to go back. Like, I didn't tell you nothing about what Yahushua looked like or nothing. Right? And then another sister, she asked, uh, she asked, she said, how, um, what she said? She said, she said, who is your neighbor? You know what I'm saying? Like, who is a neighbor? When we say we got to love our neighbor as ourselves, who was a neighbor? And I like them type of questions because them is real questions to me. Not all this, you know what I'm saying? Can a man have two wives or, you know what I'm saying? This, that, and other. It's like, no, let's get down to the practical questions of like, how do I live? You know what I'm saying? Like, how do I alter my behavior to be pleasing to the most high God? You know what I'm saying? Like, what do what can I sacrifice to then make my life more pleasing to the most high God? Those are real questions. So when I saw that one, I was like, oh yeah, I'm happy to answer that. I told her, I was like, well, you know, you know what I'm saying? Y'all, she would talk about these themes, but I would look at it in two ways, right? One. You don't make no assumptions about nobody unless you got hard evidence, you know what I'm saying, or firsthand evidence that that a person is a sinner, then you should assume, based off of anything that you're seeing, that they're righteous. And if they are, then that's your neighbor. You know what I'm saying? Like, that thing is, that thing is nice and simple because we learned that from y'all. Sure, we're not going to get into it now because we can get, you know what I'm saying, we can get into it when we, when we start reading the gospel. But we're going to learn that from y'all. Sure. All right, Yahushua did a few things that kind of develops the idea of who would the neighbor is those who could keep the will of the Father. We know that, right? This is a uh, this is a uh, Jeremiah chapter one. What did I say? Eighteen. Yeah, you won't nine. Nine. It's Jeremiah chapter one, verse uh, nine. Then Yahuwah put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and Yahuwah said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have this day. Set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down. He said to root out and to pull down. Watch this. And to destroy and to throw down. Look, and then to destroy and then to throw down. So look at everything he had to do first. He First he said, I'm going to root out, right? Then I'm going to pull down. Then I'm going to destroy. And then I'm going to throw down. Everything got to be tore up. But then after everything is towed up, guess what? What do he do? Build and to plant. Then he's going to build and he's going to plant. Right? It's important to have that expectation when we're dealing with the most high. Because you're going to read this book and the first thing you got to do is you got to root up. And you got to pull down. And you got to destroy. And you got to throw down all that foolishness that you've been taught your whole life. Then after that, 
Now you can build and plan. All right now you can take what you got in the book and then you can do it. But everything got to come down first. Right. That's how it works. What do you think happened when we went into uh, when we went into Canaan? You think you think when we went into Canaan, we was like, oh, yeah, let's take their altar and then let's just let's just wipe off the logo of their God and then put ours on top of it. Work like that. Oh, most of our God said, no, tear down all this stuff, light it on fire, let it go. Kill all of them. Don't spare nobody. Because you got to you got to root up and you got to pull down and you got to destroy and then you got to throw down. And after you get done with that, then you can build and then you can plant. That's the order. That's the way that the most high God set it up. Right. Not the other way around. That's why I think feel aggressive at first. When you first read the book, you know what I'm saying? When you're dealing with a real man of God, that thing feels aggressive. Feel like somebody attacking you. It feel like it hurt. It should at least. You know what I'm saying? That's what, you know what I'm saying? That's what a sister asked the question. She said, is that the purpose of the wilderness, right? When our people went into the wilderness, is that the purpose? Well, let's recap. Let's let's think about it. Let's look at it. What happened? We came out of Egypt on the high hand, the book say. On the high hand, right? That means everything was good. Most High God was fighting for us. He was making it obvious that he was fighting for us. Striking stuff down for us, right? So we winning. Woo! Did you see that? We crossed the sea. I thought they were about to catch up to us. It was dry land. Water on each side of us. You saw that? Hezekiah, you saw that too? I'm telling you, boy, that thing was crazy. Then we get across and then, whoo! The whole water closed on them Egyptians. They got they butt. You can imagine how excited we were. Then what happened after that? We walking around for a whole month, 30 days straight. No new food, no water, walking around, feet getting tired, bread getting old. Everything we brought from Egypt to eat is running out, running out of grain, running out of everything, right? We sitting here like, okay, 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 hold on. We haven't had no water, Moses. What happened? Moses eventually brings some water out for us, right? But as soon as he, look, as soon as we complain, and, and the water get brought out for us, the very next thing that happened is we walked to a whole thing of palm trees and a bunch of uh, springs of wells, 12 different wells and 12 different, all this stuff. We walked to a middle, in the middle of the wilderness, we walk into a paradise this whole time, nothing. Most high God waited until we complained, waited until we freaked out, and then he said, okay, well, now I'll go over there. Right? That's absolutely what the wilderness is about. You got to get all that stuff that you expect. You got to get it out your head. Your whole thinking got to be reshaped by the most high God. And in the physical sense. Those that were 20 and above that get out there, they didn't make it. They stayed in the wilderness, died in the wilderness. Right. So in the physical sense, literally, you got to leave that stuff behind. Most high God had to root out, cool down. And destroy and throw down. He took the younger ones in the next generation and then he planted and he built. Right? That's the order of Most High God at all times, always. Right? Get rid of some stuff before going. Yeah, that's exactly what it was. This is, uh, this is Nehemiah. Let's get back to it. I don't know. I'm doing a whole lot of talk. It's Nehemiah, uh, Nehemiah chapter 19, uh, what is it, 18? I mean, chapter, uh, Chapter 9, um, verse, verse what? 13. 13? Yeah. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 13. Watch what the book say. Thou came down also upon Mount Sinai and spake with them from heaven and gave them right judgments and true laws and statutes and commandments. And made us known unto them thy holy Sabbath and commanded them precepts, statutes, and laws by the hand of Moses thy servant. And gave us them bread from heaven for their hunger, and brought us forth water for them out of the rock for their thirst, and promised them that they should go in to possess the land which thou hast sworn to give them. But they and our fathers dealt proudly, and hardened their necks, and hearkened not to thy commandments, and refused to obey, neither were mindful of thy wonders that thou did among them. 
but hardened their necks and in their rebellion appointed a captain to return to their bondage. But thou art a God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and forsookest them not. Yea, when they had made them a molten calf and said, this is thy God that brought thee up out of Egypt and worshiped great provocations and brought great provocations. Yet thou and thy manifold mercies forsook them not while not in the wilderness. The pillar of the cloud departed not from them by day to lead them in the way, neither the pillar of fire by night to show them light in the way wherein they should go. Thou gavest also thy good spirit to instruct them and withheld it not thy manna from their mouth and gavest them water for their thirst. Yea, 40 years didst thou sustain them in the wilderness so that they lacked nothing. Their clothes waxed not old and their feet swelled not. Moreover, thou gavest them kingdoms and nations and did divide them into corners. So they possessed the land of Sihon and the land of in the land of the king of Heshbon and the land of Og, king of Bashan. Their children also multiplied as the stars of heaven and brought them into the land concerning which thou hast promised to their fathers that they should go in to possess it. So the children went in and possessed the land and thou shouldest and thou subdued before them the inhabitants of the land of the Canaanites and gave them into their ha hands with their kings and their people in the land of the land that they might do with them as they would. And they took strong cities in a fat land and possessed houses full of all goods, wells, digged vineyards and olive yards, and fruit trees in abundance. So they did eat and were filled and became fat and delighted themselves in thy great goodness. Nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against thee cast thy law behind their backs and killed the prophets which testified against them to turn them to thee and they right so a lot of these prophets remember we asked the question sister sharon asked the question a few others asked the question like what happened to the prophets right i remember sister sharon asked like what happened to jonah so we don't really know the book don't really document you know what i'm saying like the the fate of the pro prophets or how they died but we have we have from uh we have from history, you know what I'm saying, other scriptures where it's telling us that some of these prophets got killed, right? Some of these prophets got killed by their own people. Because it's telling us right here, he said, man, he, they killed the prophets, right? So it's some, it's some speculation about who they are, but I don't refer to it just because it didn't come from scripture, you know what I'm saying? But, uh, you know what I'm saying, some of these prophets got killed. Keep going. Therefore, you deliver them into the hand of their enemies who vexed them in the time of their trouble. When they cried unto thee, you heard them from heaven, according to thy manifold, manifold, manifold mercies and gave them saviors who saved them out of the hand of their enemies. But after they had rest, they did evil again before thee. Therefore, you leftest thou them in the land of their enemies so that they had dominion over them. Yet when they returned and cried unto thee, you heard them from heaven. And many times did you deliver them according to thy mercies and testified against them that thou might bring them again unto thy law. Yet they dealt proudly and hearkened not unto thy commandments, but sinned against thy judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. And mm -hmm. withdrew the shoulder and hardened their neck and would not hear. Yet many years did thou forbear them and testified against them by the spirit in thy prophets, yet would they not give ear. Therefore gave them into the land of the people of the lands, the hand of the people of the lands. Nevertheless, for thy great mercy's sake, you did not utterly consume them, nor forsake them, for you are a gracious and merciful God. Now therefore, our God, the great, the mighty, and the terrible God who keeps covenant and mercy, let not all the trouble see, seem little before thee, that thou hast come upon us, on our kings, our princes, and our priests, and on our prophets and our fathers and on thy people since the time the kings of Assyria unto this day. Howbeit you are just in all that is brought upon us, for you have done right, but we have done wickedly. Neither have our kings, our princes, our priests, nor our fathers kept your law, nor hearken unto your commandments and thy testimonies where you did testify against them. For they have not served thee in their king in their kingdom, and in thy great goodness that thou gave them and in the large and fat land which you gave before them, neither turn they from their wicked works. Behold, we are servants this day, and for the land that thou gavest unto our fathers to eat the fruit thereof and the good thereof, behold, we are servants in it. And it yielded much increase unto the kings whom thou hast set over us because of our sins. Also, they have dominion over our bodies and over our cattle and our pleasure, and we are in great distress. 
And because of all this, we make a sure covenant and write it, and our princes, Levites, and princes seal unto it. All right. So what he what what he was just explaining there is because like this is our history. I acknowledge that we messed up multiple times and that you write in every way that you dealt with it. Therefore, that's why we here and we in our land and it's our land. But we don't even we don't even like we 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 are subservient to another group. We making them rich. We working for them. We don't even have control over our own bodies in our own land. Right. This is our land. I'll be it. Right. We there. We here in the land. But you know what I'm saying? We work for the king. Right. We work for a uh, hostage. So he's lamenting at that. But at the same time, acknowledging that, like, no, no, I get it. You know what I'm saying? We just read the law for three hours. I get I get exactly why I played out like this. I get it. I understand. But man, God. Right. Keep going. Was it chapter 10? Mm -hmm. Now these that sealed were Nehemiah, the Tirshatha, the son of Hakaliah, and Zidkijah, Sariah, Azariah, Jeremiah, Pasher, Amariah, Malkijah, Hattush, Shabani, Shabaniah, Malak, Haram, Merimoth, Obadiah, Daniel, Gideon, Ginnithon, Baruch, Shalom, Abijah, Mijamin, Maziah, Meaziah, Bilgai, Shemaiah, these were the priests, the Levites, the Levites, both Yahushua, the son of Azaniah, Benui, the sons of Hadad, Cadmiel, and their brethren, Shebaniah, Hodajiah, Kalida, Peliah, Hanan, Micah, Rehob, Hashbiah, Zachar, Sherebiah, Shebaniah, Hodajah, Benai. Is this whole chapter names? Huh? No, Is this whole chapter name. No, the chief of the no. people, and the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the porters, the singers, Nethanims, and all they, and all they that had separated themselves from the people of the lands unto the law of God, their wives, their sons, and their daughters, everyone having knowledge and having understanding, they clave to their brother and the nobles and entered into a curse and into an oath to walk in God's law, which was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of Yahuwah our Lord. And his judgments and his statutes that we would not give our daughters unto the people of the land nor take their daughters for our sons and so this is the covenant that they make right they say listen this is the agreement that we're making we will not give our daughters to the gentiles nor will we take their daughters onto our sons right watch this and if the people of the land bring where or any victuals of the sabbath day to sell that we would not buy it of them on the sabbath or on the holy day that we would leave the seventh year and the exaction of every day also we right so this also they saying they say listen this is also the agreement i want y'all to pay attention to what they're doing they are they are making a vow right now there is nothing wrong with what they're doing they are making a vow but the vow that they are making they're putting extra restriction on themselves. Why are they doing this? They're doing this because they know that they've come from captivity. They're back in the land, but we're technically still in captivity, right? So that's what his complaint was at the end of the prayer is that, listen, I get why you did everything you did, Mozart. I get I understand we wrong. And that's why we're here, although we in our land. We don't even got no ownership of our own bodies. You know what I'm saying? We got to pay this man. You know what I'm saying? We work, 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 and we got to pay him. We got to pay the king. We got to pay taxes and tribute. We don't like that. Right? So now, as a result, he's saying, look, we all going to make this seal. Then he goes through all the names of the people that, that kind of, when you think of the seal, just like think of a contract. Everybody who's about to sign this contract. The contract is not saying we going to do whatever the law say. The contract is saying we are going to, on top of the law, that's a given, right? On top of the law, we're going to put extra restriction on ourselves. There's no law saying I can't have a Gentile and I can't, you know, I can't, I can't give my, my, my son or, or a daughter to a Gentile, right? <clears throat> but they're saying, despite what the law says, 
we're going to put an extra restriction on ourselves. We're going to go further than what the law says to contain ourselves, to show a vow to you. This is the agreement that we, we, we put in forth. So now they're saying they won't marry Gentiles nor give their daughters into marriage to any Gentile. They only going to stay within the people. Then on top of that, they said from now on, we not even going to buy on the Sabbath. Right. If these Gentiles come to, because we know ain't nobody selling or buying because ain't nobody working in our land. But if the Gentiles come to the gate, like, yo, 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 you know what I'm saying? I know y'all don't work on the Sabbath, but you know what I'm saying? Got these cheesecakes. You know what I'm saying? No pork. You know what I'm saying? Like, no, no, you know what I'm saying? No, all, all clean foods. Got these cheesecakes. What y'all want to do? Just $7. Just pop it out the gate for me. You know what I'm saying? Our people was at the thing like, yeah, man, I'm hungry. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Wife ain't make nothing to eat for the Sabbath. You know what I'm saying? They're good. Yeah, appreciate you, appreciate you. So we buying, we selling on the Sabbath. Not and they say, okay, you know what? We ain't even gonna do that. We wouldn't right? we wouldn't be selling on the Sabbath. Huh? So we wouldn't be selling on the Sabbath. Yeah, sorry, we buying on the Sabbath. Yeah, you're right. We buying on the Sabbath. Right? And they look like, nah, we ain't even gonna do that. We ain't even gonna play with these people like that. Right. We're going to stop. We're going to stop dealing with the Gentiles on the Sabbath. And we aren't going instead of just not the Canaanites, we not going to give our daughters to anybody. We ain't going to marry, let our sons marry anybody other than our people. Right. These I just want you all to realize these are extra restrictions that they putting on themselves as a vow. Right. That would be like me. Right. That would be like me saying. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Okay, it's not law. I'm not a sinner if I don't read the Bible every single day. But I might make a vow because it's good to read the Bible, right? It's better to read the Bible than to not read the Bible. I may make a vow and say, every single day, without fail, I am going to make sure I read at least a chapter of the Bible. Right? That is a vow. Right? I might even say something like, okay, it's good to have the Sabbath. But you know what? I'm going to dedicate two days to the Most High God. So now, two days out of the week, one is the Sabbath and another one, I'm going to have a sacred assembly. Right? Or I might say something like, I'm going to fast once a month, once a month to the Most High God. That's not no law. That's not on our calendar. Right? But that's an extra vow that I put on my place, my, on, uh, on myself. And once it becomes a vow, at that point, for me, who made that vow, and everybody who signed on to that vow, guess what? It's as good as law. Right? This, what we're reading right now, is going to be very important. Because once we switch over to the New Testament next week, it's going to be like a fast forward of 400 years. So we're going to have to see what the attitude is now, and then imagine what happens between that 400 year period. Imagine all the interactions. We're going to talk about it when we get into the New Testament, kind of kind of the things that we learned from the from the book of Maccabees. We're not going to read from the book of Maccabees, but it's a couple books that describe some of the events. Right. And uh, we'll 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 talk a little bit about them and we'll talk about how the people developed into what we see as the Pharisees and the, uh, the Sadducees. Where did that mindset come from? What was the genesis of it? I'm telling y'all, this what we reading right now. Although this is nothing bad, right? This does lead to people being tempted into looking at things a little bit warped, right? No fault of Nehemiah's. Ain't that Nehemiah did anything wrong? Ain't nobody do nothing wrong in what we reading right now. What they did is noble. What they doing is right. But it just shows that no matter what, Satan is constantly trying to get you to misunderstand something, take something too far, and that's what people do after the person that did something right. Right. I could do something right right now and I say, OK, you know what? I'm a fast every month on the first and I teach my son to fast every month on the first. But he don't know. I did that as a vow to the most high God. So since I taught him that way, because it was something strong for me, guess what my son going to say? Oh, man, if you don't fast every month, every every month on the first, you a sinner. Now, that becomes a sin for my son because that's not what the book say. Right. That's his stuff that he put on it. That's not what the books say, right? Let's go. Keep going. Uh, 
And if the people of the land bring ware of any victuals on the Sabbath day to sell, that we will not buy it of them on hold the on, Sabbath. Hold on. So look, the uh, I just want to, Sister Pam. That yeah, this is this is where everybody get it from right here, right? Everybody, everybody get that Hebrews can't marry outside of the outside of the nation. They get that from right here. But I want to make it clear: this is not added law, nor is it presented as added law, right? This is not Nehemiah saying. Look, this is law from now on. Nobody can do this. He's made, being very clear that this is the covenant that he's making. It's not, it's not a covenant that God made with them. This is the covenant that they're making with God. So it's a vow. It's what they're agreeing to do for the most high God. Right? So it's not an added law. It's in, in, nor did, did he attempt to, to add to the law or anything like that. That's just how we read it. When we read it, we make that assumption and we say, just like the Pharisees did. Right? So just like the Pharisees, we're going to read about the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and they did the exact same thing. They developed traditions of men, traditions of the elders. So these are the elders. When you read, when you read the uh when you read the uh the the Pharisees talk about, you know what I'm saying, the traditions of the elders and all that, Nehemiah is an elder. And there's an elder that come after him and an elder that come after him. And it goes. And so all of these guys are building traditions to restrict themselves. Again, it starts in a good place. But then we lose context. And once we lose context, we start to make assumptions. And once we make assumptions, then we start calling people sinners for something that a man came up. with, Even if that man who came up with it was a righteous man and had no ill will about it. Right. That's just how it works. Y'all remember um uh what's his name? Uh is it uh what was his name? Uh Gideon? Was it Gideon? Yeah. The Ephi. The Ephi, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Gideon went out, you know what I'm saying, and made a golden ephi. Gideon wasn't trying to make no darn idol. You know what I'm saying? You think Gideon was Gideon talked to the to the most high God directly. You know what I'm saying? Most high God showed him signs and wonders. You think he was trying to come up with an idol? No. Gideon made an ephah. That's what the priests wear. It wasn't no, there wasn't no golden calf or nothing like that. But guess what? Nevertheless, he made it, and the people after him did what? They bowed down to it. He made a golden ephah, and the people bowed down to it and started worshiping. So that become a stumbling block for them, but that's not what, what Gideon intended. That wasn't his mindset. That wasn't his hope, right? And that's what happens. Sometimes we do stuff, and then the next person, you know what I'm saying, comes along, and they use it for a stumbling block. Does so Pam asks, how does that work with uh, Purim? You got you to gotta, you gotta help me out what you mean. How does what work with Purim? Right. But so what we have is always it's always an opportunity that anything Satan can Satan can use anything to deceive us. You know what I'm saying? So we got to we got to make sure that we were always working with a book called circumspect. I mean, on guard at all times. Right. It wasn't part. It wasn't part of the. The three X's we went up the three times we went up, it was added. Oh, yeah. Purim, what you mean Purim was added? It wasn't added to the law. It was just, it's in the book. Yeah, so it's a different, the law, the law is just the first five books, right? And then, and then Joshua, Joshua added, add, Joshua added to the law, right? But outside of that, it wasn't nobody else that added to no law, right? Joshua said, Joshua, when he was bringing us into the land, he did add something to the law. He said that, he said that, you know what I'm saying, what he said add, was added to the law. You know what I'm saying? And we'll 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 get to that when we're reading in our Bible in a year. But outside of that, it wasn't nobody else that 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 added to the law. You know what I'm saying? Everybody else is just a prophet. So what what Purim is is a tradition. That's just a tradition that's in the book. But that's not law. Like you can't call nobody a sinner for for but that's what could happen, right? Somebody might, there might be Hebrews out there calling somebody a sinner for not keeping Purim. And if you do that, then you're wrong. You're in violation. Right? That's why it's very important that we got we to gotta make sure that we look at what the scripture is saying and make no assumptions. What it say is what it say. 
I'm not going no further than what it say. I'm not going nothing beyond it. Right? So yeah, we celebrate Purim as a feast day. That don't make it law though, right? No different from uh the festival uh, the the festival of lights or the uh feast of dedication. Right? It's a lot of brothers that keep the feast of dedication and it's in the book too, right? Both of them is in the book. Don't make it law. Right? We can't call nobody a sinner for not doing it, but it is a tradition of our people, right? So again, nothing wrong with tradition. Holding hair and, and holding hands and praying, saying grace, all oh, that's a tradition. Ain't law. Even if it were in the book, wouldn't be law unless Moses told us to do it. Right? Wouldn't be law unless Yahushua told us to do it. Right? If it didn't come from those two people, ain't law. With the exception of Joshua, who did add something to the law by the hand of the Most High God. But, you know what I'm saying? Other than that, you know what I'm saying? None of this stuff is law. <coughs> right? None of this stuff is law. It's just tradition. And it's okay. Ain't nothing wrong with it. Right, I don't want y'all to get the met right, the wrong message. It's nothing wrong with what Nehemiah did. It is nothing wrong with what Esther and Mordecai did. It is nothing wrong with the Christians for saying, "Hold your hands and pray." None of that stuff is wrong, right? However, if we jump out the gate and start telling people they a sinner for not doing some of this stuff that we came up with, some of the stuff that Mordecai came up with, some of the stuff that uh uh uh. Uh, Nehemiah came up with now we sinners right we become sinners if we try to hold the commandments of men no matter how righteous the men is no matter how 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 visionary those men are as soon as we start trying to hold people accountable as if God said did it and it was a man that said did it now we in trouble and that's what we're going to be reading about throughout most of the gospel when we re when we start reading it next week all right, keep going. Yeah, remember the, the scripture is not law, right? Law is what Moses gave us and what, what Yahushua gives us. Those are laws, right? If it come out of Yahushua mouth as a commandment, if it come out of Moses mouth as a commandment, that's law, right? And our law says don't add or take away from the law, right? All the rest of this stuff are prophecies and documentation of history, and it's in our book, but it is not law. It is not binding as instruction from the Most High God, in the same way, at least. That's not part. I ain't going to say it like that way, because some, some of these prophecies is absolutely binding. It's not the agreement that our people are going to be held accountable for. Our people agreed to keep the stuff that Moses said from the Most High God. That was the agreement. That was the covenant that we made, right? And as part of that covenant, Moses said it was going to be another guy, whatever he say that we ought to do, right? And as part of that covenant, it connects us to the, to the new covenant, right? So those are the ones that we held responsible for. All the rest of this stuff, everything that we get, it's informational, it's context, it gives us guidance, it's good, all of it's great, but it is not law. Important to know that. Keep going. And that we would leave the seventh year in the exaction of every debt. Also, we made ordinances for us to charge ourselves yearly with the third part of a shekel for the service of the house of our God. For the showbread and for the continual meat offering and for the continual burnt offering and the Sabbaths and the new moons for the set feasts and for the holy things and for the sin offerings to make an atonement for Israel and for all the work of the house of our God. And we cast the lots among the priests, Levites and the people for the wood offering to bring it unto the house of our God after the houses of our fathers at times appointed year by year to burn upon the altar of you who are our God as it is written in the law. And to bring the first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of all fruit of trees year by year unto the house of Yahuwah. <clears throat> also, the firstborn of our sons and our cattle, as it is written in the law, and the firstlings of our herds and our flocks to bring to the house of our God, unto the priests that minister into the house of our God, and that we should bring the first fruits of our dough and our offerings and the fruit of all manner of trees, and the wine and of oil unto the priests to the chambers of the house of our God 
and the tithes of our ground unto the Levites, that the same Levites might have the tithes in all the cities of our village of our tillage. And the priest, the son of Aaron, shall be with the Levites when the Levites take tithes, and the Levites shall bring up the tithe of the tithes unto the house of our God, to the chambers, into the treasure house. For the children of Israel and the children of Levi shall bring the offering of corn, of new wine, and of oil in the chambers where all where are the vessels of the sanctuary and the priests that minister and the porters and the singers, and we will not forsake the house of our God. Keep going. And the rulers, them, right? Yeah, and the rulers of the people who dwelt at Jerusalem, the rest of the people also cast lots to bring one of ten to dwell in Jerusalem, the holy city, and nine parts to dwell in other cities. And the people blessed all the men that willingly offered themselves to dwell at Jerusalem. But these are the chief of the province, chief of the province that dwelt in Jerusalem. For the cities of Judah dwelt every one in his possession in their cities to wit Israel, the priests, the Levites, and the Nethanims, and the children of Solomon's servants. And at Jerusalem dwelt certain of the children of Judah and the children of Benjamin, of the children of Judah, Atiah and the son of Uzziah, the son of Zechariah, the son of Amariah, the son of Shephatiah, the son of Machalil, Machalil, Machalil. Yeah, I need the whole chapter? No. Jump, jump Wait, down. Hold on now. Yeah. Uh, let's, let, let's go. So it go through the names of the different people and where they live in. They cast lots. Right. So they had to cast lots to kind of figure out who was going to live where, because everybody, everybody going to want to um, live in different places. Some people that's like, man, I don't even want to live in Jerusalem. And why wouldn't they want to live in Jerusalem? That's what we go down there. Right. That's the target. Right. So some people are like, man, listen, I'm going to live outside. Let me go up to Benjamin. You know what I'm saying? Let me go up to, you know what I'm saying? Let me go up there where the Gentiles at in, uh, Ephraim. You know what I'm saying? Let me live on the outskirts. I stay in Judah, but I ain't going to be in Jerusalem. Let me live on the house. I'm going to go to Hebron. Right? So it's like it's different people that's like, I don't necessarily want to live in Jerusalem. But there were some people that willingly wanted to live in Jerusalem, and that was a blessing to, to, for them. So historically, everybody wanted to, if you in Judah, everybody wanted to live in Jerusalem. Right? But you got to think about the trauma that our people went through. Jerusalem was where the king was, and that was the main place of attack. Right? So now it's like, man, the king break out against, you know, we we live in this constant fear now that like, because it's happened. Like, you know what I'm saying? We saw it happen. So it's like, uh, no, nah, if the king get mad, he probably going to come right to Jerusalem. I'm going to go ahead and live, you know what I'm saying? Go ahead, give me another spot. You know what I'm saying? Go ahead and live, you know what I'm saying, outside the city. Right? But some people was like, no, nah, look, go ahead, go ahead and let me stay in Jerusalem. So they cast lots to kind of figure out who's going to stay in Jerusalem, who's going to live in other places. So it starts to document all the names of the people and where they live. Let's jump over to uh, chapter 12, verse 1. Yeah, that is 12. Oh, that was 12? Uh, well, yeah, no, we in 12 now, but 12 go over all of the names too. Oh, okay. What about 13? Hold on. Thirteen in names too? No. Let's do thirteen verse one then. All right. On that we day, read this. Watch, watch uh, Nehemiah. Watch, watch his attitude. All right, you kind of seen it throughout what we what we've been reading, but watch his attitude at the very end of this. It's the last chapter, right? Thirteen is the last yeah. chapter. Yeah. Watch, 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 his, watch his attitude at the very end of this. this is, uh, Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 1 I mean chapter 13 verse 1 on that day they read in the book of Moses in the audience of the people and therein was found written that the Ammonite and the Moabite should not come into the congregation of God forever because they met not the children of Israel with bread and with water but hired Balaam against them that he should curse them Howbeit, our God turned the curse into a blessing now it came to pass when they had heard the law that they separated from Israel all the mixed multitude. And before this, Eliashib, the priest, having the oversight of the chamber of the house of our God, was allied unto Tobiah. And he had prepared for him a great chamber where aforetime they had laid uh, the meat offerings. 
frankincense, the vessels, and the tithes, the corn, and the new wine, the oil, which was commanded to be given to the Levites and the singers and the porters, the offerings of the priests. But in all this time was not I at Jerusalem, for in the two and thirteenth year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, came I unto the king after certain days obtained I leave of the king. And I came to Jerusalem and understood that the evil that Eliashib had did for Tobiah in preparing, in preparing him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. And it grieved me sore. Therefore, I cast forth all the household stuff of Tobiah out of the chamber. Then I commanded that they clean the chambers. And there brought I again the vessels of the house of God with the meat offering and the frankincense. And I perceived that the portions of the Levites had not been given them. For the Levites and the singers that did the work were fled everyone to his field. Then I contended with the rulers and said, why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their place and brought all Judah, the tithe of the corn and the new wine and the oil unto the treasures. And I made right. the treasuries. So now listen, Nehemiah, just a couple chapters ago, made an agreement, right? He made a vow to the most high God that this is what we going to do. And everybody signed it. So now Nehemiah freaking out like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We just agreed. That we are going to pay tithes. We are going to bring our first fruit. This is all the stuff we said we are going to do everything according to the law on this part. And then he go to the temple. He's like, man, this thing is forsaken. You ain't did what we, we ain't up, uh, we ain't upholding our end of the bargain. Now think about the trauma that you feel. We just got back. We just now getting ourselves reestablished. We really not even on our feet yet. We all still poor. We all still doing bad. Why are y'all playing with God? So now he roughing people up and telling them, like, no, nah, get this thing together. Right? Watch this. Keep going. And I made treasuries over the treasuries of Shelemiah the priest over the treasuries. Shelemiah the priest and Zadok the scribe and of the Levites, Pedaiah. And next to them was Hanan, the son of Zakur, the son of Madaniah, for they were counted faithful in their office was to distribute unto their brothers. Remember me, O my God, concerning this, and wipe not out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and for the offices there. Now Whoa. listen to his attitude, right? He has this fear of God, right? Because for him, it's like, man, I know he's serious. I've seen it. I've seen this guy just wipe us all off right according to how his law is. So he's not playing. He's looking like, look, God, I did my part. I'm trying to keep these people together. They doing whatever they want to do. God, just remember me. Please don't blot my name out. Look after me now. You know what I'm saying? Like, please don't forget about me. I know these people are wicked. They doing whatever they want to do. I'm trying my hardest to keep them in line. You see what I'm doing out here. God, just remember me. Please don't blot my name out. So this is trauma that we're hearing about. Right? Even before, he, when, they, when, they, when they read the law, they interpreted it as saying the Moabite and the Ammonite can't get in forever. But that's not what the law say. Right? What our law actually say is to the 10th generation. It says even to the 10th generation. Right? But they look at it like, no, they can't get in forever. That's a problem, right? So that ends up, but this is all coming from trauma. Right? Keep going. Watch this. In those days, I saw in Judah some trading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in sheaves and lading donkeys and as also wine, grapes and figs and all manner of burdens, which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I right. Took so now these people are breaking the Sabbath. They carry they carry in burdens. Watch what he do. And I testified against them in a day wherein they sold victuals and dwelt. And there dwelt men of Tyre also therein, which brought fish and all manner of ware. And sold unto the sold on the Sabbath unto the children of Judah and Jerusalem. Then I contended with the nobles of Judah and said unto them, What evil thing is this you do, and profane the Sabbath day? Did not your fathers thus, and did not our God bring all this evil upon us and upon this city? Yet you now how did they profane right. the Sabbath day? Some were treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in sheaves, laden donkeys. They were carrying burdens and laboring on the Sabbath day. That is profaning the Sabbath day, right? Keep going. Watch this. Yet you bring more wrath upon Israel by profaning the Sabbath. And it came to pass that when the gates of Jerusalem began to be dark before the Sabbath, I commanded that the gates should be shut. 
and charged that they should not open them until after the Sabbath. Some of my servants said I at the gates that there should no burden be brought in on the Sabbath day. So the there shall no what? Burden be brought in on the Sabbath day. He said, I closed the gates because y'all were carrying burdens on the Sabbath day. So in other words, it's like, hey, I'm just uh, carrying this whole load that I got from the Gentiles, just bringing it in. It's the Sabbath day. You're carrying it on your back. That's profane. That's breaking the Sabbath. That's against our law. Right? So that's why he closed the gates. Watch this. Keep going. <clears throat> so the merchants and sellers of any kind that of any kind of ware lodged outside Jerusalem once or twice. Then I testified against them and said unto them, Why lodge ye about the wall? If you do so again, I will lay hands on you. From that time forth came they no more on the Sabbath. And I right? So now, after the gates was closed, the Gentiles was at the door, at the gates, and they were trying to sell on the Sabbath. Well, the Gentiles ain't bound by the Sabbath. They can sell. And buying is not labor. Right? But now... What Nehemiah has done is because we made an agreement, we made a vow to not buy or sell. Right? So now he said, listen, I'm going to put my hands on y'all if y'all come back around here again. He said, the Gentiles took them serious. Gentiles, they ain't come back around there no more. Right? So I want y'all to separate the part that's against the law and the part that was against the vow. Our law don't say nothing about buying on the Sabbath. It says we can't, us, we can't work. We can't bear burdens. And that's exactly what the people were doing. So they did profane the Sabbath. A lot of brothers go here to prove that you can't buy or sell on the Sabbath. And now, listen, don't buy or sell. I don't, I'm not trying to tell you to go buy and sell on the Sabbath. Like, you know what I'm saying? Don't. But you can't sell. You can't work on the Sabbath. For sure, that's law. You can't carry no burdens on the Sabbath. That's law. And that's what he is speaking to about profaning the Sabbath, right? That was truly what profaned the Sabbath. Keep going. And I commanded the Levites that they should cleanse themselves and that they should come and keep the gates to sanctify the Sabbath on the Sabbath day. Keep the gates. And, and let me say this. Him telling the Gentiles to keep, keep from selling to our people on the Sabbath, it wasn't wrong. There is nothing wrong with anything that he did at this point. Right? He didn't do nothing wrong. Keep going. Remember me, oh my God, concerning this also. Right? So he's telling most our God again, remember me. And spare, me end? and spare me according to the greatness of thy mercy. In those days also saw I Jews that had married wives of Ashdod and of Ammon mm -hmm. and of Moab. And their children spake half the speech of Ashdod and could not speak in the Jews' language, but according to the language of each people. And mm -hmm. I contended with them and cursed them and smote certain of them and plucked out their mm -hmm. hair. And made them swear by God, saying, "Ye shall not give your daughters unto their sons, nor take their daughters unto your sons, or for yourselves." Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations was there no king like him, who was beloved of his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, even him did outlandish women cause him to sin. Shall we then hearken unto you to do all this great evil, to transgress against our God and marrying strange wives? One of the sons of Jehoiada, the son of Eliashib, the high priest, was son-in-law of Sambalot, the Horonite. Therefore, I chased him from, he, from me. Remember me, O oh my God, because they have defiled the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and of the Levites. Thus cleanse I them from all their strangers and appointed the words of the priests and the, the wards of the priests and the Levites, everyone in his business, and for the wood offering at times appointed, and for the first fruits, remember me, O oh my God, for good. Right. So remember, the law for the high priest was he had to marry a, a, a Hebrew and she had to be a virgin. Right. On top of that, they made a vow saying they wouldn't give their daughters to any of the Gentiles. And now he has to protect against that vow. Right. There's another place that the brothers will go and they'll misunderstand. They'll say, you know what? We can't have Gentiles. See, Nehemiah said Nehemiah is not law. Nehemiah is talking about a vow, right? So we Everything this, uh, that we get, it has to be a based off of the law, right? Brother, but is that, that brother? Who was, huh? who, was, who was that brother that used to come? It was somebody who used to come visit us, and they were saying that he 
they they was tripping on him saying because his wife was white or something like that and they were saying like he couldn't he went, you know what i'm talking about no nah. it was this dude he had a white wife and i remember he was like he left his congregation or something like that because they said he wasn't supposed to be married to her or something so like wow i don't remember it was crazy he came to us yeah yeah he used to come to us yeah in person yeah his wife too yeah i think so i don't know I don't, i'm drawing a blank oh but uh but yeah you know what i'm saying it's like that's that is what these brothers teach and i get it i understand why they teach it but i want us to appreciate the, the separation between the law and the history right what we reading right now is the history but then i also want you to see that in a lot of cases they not even saying this law right most of this stuff <coughs> nehemiah is he's reacting to the vow that he made He's not necessarily reacting. Remember, everybody signed off on that vow. He went through all the names of the people that signed off of their vow. They were representative of the people. Yeah, those were the priests and the Levites. Yeah, so it's like this is not, this is not like, this is not like it's just Nehemiah. He's looking like, no, we need to get this thing together. Remember, Ezra and the same thing. They made a vow. It's the same vow. Right? So it's He's taking it serious because it is serious, so he's not doing nothing wrong, but it's important for us to be able to separate it. Is that the end of the chapter? Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's important for us to be able to separate it because the same way that our brethren now look at this and they say, see, you're not supposed to do X, Y, and Z. See, you're not supposed to do X, Y, and Z. We about to read about the Pharisees doing the exact same thing, right? So when we read through this New Testament, Y'all going to see, those, those, those of y'all who haven't gone through us teaching the New Testament before, y'all going to see that it's almost going to feel sympathetic to the Pharisees when we read it, right? Because I want y'all to understand where does this com come from? I'm going to help justify what the Fer how the Pharisees looked at this stuff. We always look at it like, oh, the wicked Pharisees, the wicked Sadducees. No, 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 no. You know what I'm saying? They wicked for sure, but it ain't that simple. Your butt would have been wicked too because you would have been convinced that it was the right thing to do. Right? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to kind of look at it. I just want y'all to see this is where a lot of this stuff came from. How is it not adding to the law? You're doing what the law says, but adding additional stipulations. So adding to the law would be me saying in 2024, I don't think people should smoke cigarettes. Right? So then. I go to the book and I write in there, Moses also said, don't smoke cigarettes. Then I go to people and I say, you know what? Moses said, don't smoke cigarettes. You a sinner, you going to hell. That's adding to the law. Or adding to the law would just be saying, hey, on top of everything else that Moses said, he, uh, you also shouldn't smoke cigarettes. God don't want that. That's a law. Right? If I told people, Smoking cigarettes is against the law. That would be adding to the law, right? But if I say, hey, we in, in the congregation of Philip do not smoke cigarettes. And in my household, we do not smoke cigarettes. And my wife can't smoke cigarettes. And my kids can't smoke cigarettes. And nobody that's around me can smoke cigarettes. And if you try to smoke cigarettes in my house, I'm kicking you out, right? That's not a law. Even if I praise God when I do it, right? That's my jurisdiction. That's my family. That's my house. Those are my property. So I don't want you smoking cigarettes on my, that's against my law. That's not against God's law. But if I call you a sinner for doing it, now I've added to the law. Right? So again, traditions are fine. We can add traditions all we want. We can do whatever we want. with tradition. We have the freedom to do whatever we want as long as we don't violate law or commandment from Yahushua. If we don't violate that, we can do whatever we want to do. We can add whatever we want. We just can't call it something from Yah if it's not from Yah. Right? And that's what Nehemiah was doing. Right? For the most case, what we was reading about with Nehemiah, he was making a vow to the Most High God saying, hey, in addition to what, for a lot of stuff, not everything, some of the stuff he was making a vow to just keep the law. Right? When he was talking about the tithes and the first fruits and all that, that's, that's our law anyway. Right. So that's just what we are supposed to be doing anyway. But he was making a vow like, no, we're going to get this together. We're going to put this thing back in order. Right. When he's talking about the seventh year of release, 
That's our law anyway. Right. So he's he is making a vow saying we're going to keep the law. But also as part of his uh, vow, he, he he vowed for things that weren't part of the law. He said, listen, we ain't going to give our, our children to none of these Gentiles. None of them. We ain't going to buy or sell on the Sabbath at all. Right. So he had to then keep up with the vows that he made. So at the end, he's trying to show the most high God like, man, I worked hard. Look, man, I tried to do this stuff. I know these people is wicked. They about to do whatever they want to do. But please don't forget me. Yo. Please don't forget me. Like, don't blot me out your book. Just remember me. I tried. Right. And I wanted y'all to notice that that was his attitude the whole time. Because you remember Sister Pam, I wanted you to notice too, because Sister Pam, we were we were talking. And and you were just like, man, I just, I mean, I just don't, like, do you ever get the, I think you said something like, do you ever get the feeling that, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you just don't want to be around none of this wickedness. You know what I'm saying? Like, none of the wickedness in the world. You know what I'm saying? Like, dang, I just wish God could just take me away from the wickedness of the world. I was, I was trying to let you know it's different people in this book that felt that way. That's a righteous feeling. All right, it's a righteous feeling for the stuff to make you mourn and make you sick and make you cry. You know what I'm saying? For the stuff we see in this world, that's a righteous feeling, right? And that's pretty much how Nehemiah was feeling. He was like, listen, man, I'm doing my best in the midst of these wicked, stiff-necked people. I'm trying to keep them. I'm wrestling them. I'm pushing them. I'm punching them. I'm doing whatever I can to make them stay in line, and they keep rebelling. Please just remember the work I'm doing. I know I'm in the midst of these people, and I'm tied up with them, and I'm in the midst of their wickedness. But please notice me in the midst of it. I ain't doing the stuff that they do. I'm trying to help them out. I'm trying to figure this thing out. I'm trying to get them back in line. These people are wicked. Right? That's kind of like his attitude in the midst of it. He didn't like that. He didn't like being around the wickedness either. That's why he's telling Most High God to remember him. Any other questions? That's the Old Testament there, boys. Ladies and gentlemen. That's it. That's the Old Testament. That's the conclusion of the matter. You know minus, what I mean? minus the the the, the, the Psalms, Psalms and Proverbs, and Proverbs and the Ecclesiastes. And we didn't really go through that much. I recommend y'all go read those. Also, Songs of Solomon. We didn't really go through. Yeah. And uh, yeah, but we, we did Lamentations, Prophets. Huh? I said we went through most of the prophets. Yeah, we touched uh, the prophet. We touched all the prophets. We didn't. We didn't. Yeah, we didn't read every page. We touched. We touched most of the prophets. We didn't read every page of Kings and Chronicles either. You know what I'm saying? It's, we didn't read every single page, but you know what I'm saying? It's uh, we we touched most of the books. Mm -hmm. We touched all the narrative books for sure. Yeah, yeah. So congratulations for sticking through it. Y'all, uh, y'all made it. You know, um, know a whole lot. I'm sure y'all know a whole lot more than when we started. So. That's good. And uh, us too, you know, getting all these refreshers in, you know. So, appreciate it. Next week, we're going to start the New Testament, y'all willing? Um, and we'll start to we'll start to learn about Yahushua. Now, with this foundation of, of, of the scripture, right, we have now the whole, we have a good foundation now of the whole scripture. Right, those of us who, 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 who watched all the videos all the way through, even if you haven't, go to the YouTube page. It's a YouTube uh, playlist on our page, and it's called, what's it called? Through the Bible or Journey Through the Bible, I think it is, something like that. Go to that Journey Through the Bible playlist, and all of it, starting at Genesis, is in order. If you want to go back and if you missed any, if you start watching at a certain point, go on back, catch up so that you can get an understanding of this stuff. Just watch it in your free time. Let it play while you, you know what I'm saying? Let it play while you, while you, while you listening to it when you're in the gym. Let it play while you're listening to it, while you're driving, whatever you got to do. But get this stuff in you, right? Read the book for yourself. Understand it. Challenge whatever you're hearing. Challenge whatever you're seeing. When we get into this New Testament, it's going to be valuable to have that understanding. A lot of you are going to start seeing all these connections. You're going to see all these references. The more of this stuff you keep in memory, the more references you're going to catch and the more rich and the more powerful this word will be to you. Right? Yeah, it's a, it's a glorious thing that the Most High God let us see it through. Now, y'all willing, we'll start the New Testament and we'll see that through. New Testament tends to go a lot quicker than the Old Testament for a few reasons. One, because there's four books that cover the gospel, but it's all covering the same event. So we won't be reading all four of those books. 
what we'll be doing is we'll be picking we'll be picking that narrative from one of the books sometimes we'll jump you know back and forth just to get a different different view or get different details but we won't be reading all four of them so the gospel itself you get through the gospel a lot quicker than reading four different books and then the uh and then the narrative will um will uh kind of be around the the, the events of acts and then what we're going to do is we're going to weave in the epistle letters and what we're reading through Acts. You know what I'm saying? So just different things in order based off of how it happens in Acts. That's when we'll start to weave in what we read in the epistle letters. Um, and then finally, y'all will end off with Revelation. <clears throat> Good. Good. I'm excited. All right. Well, let's pray out. <clears throat> 